ladies and gentlemen, James Fallon. I'm a scientist who studies the brain, and I've been a neuroscientist for about 40 years. And most of that 40 years, I've been what's called a small-time scientist. I have a small lab, only a few people, small grants. And, and most scientists are like this. Uh, we're kind of hobbits. And the whole idea of being a hobbit is that you stay within the wheelhouse of your expertise. Uh, you don't talk to the media. You don't give talks like this. And you just stay under the radar for everything. And if you mind your own business, everything will be OK. And that's uh, really how I live my, almost my entire scientific life. Now, generally, uh, I was like a pretty average guy. I was a class clown in high school. I still have my Teamsters card, which I can go back to at any time, hopefully. <laughs> and the first date I ever had, we were both 12 years old. I'm still dating her 50 years later. So quite an, a you know, an average regular guy, seriously. And uh, so anyway, the, part, the kind of science I was doing, which is the basic chemistry connections of the brain and also adult stem cells, uh, that was going along just fine. And then I got a call from some colleagues in psychiatry and radiology. And they said, you've got to come over here. We've got a really cool new machine. And the cool new machine was a, a PET scanner, positron emission tomography. And the great thing about this is you're able to see inside the human brain, the living human brain, and activates certain areas of the brain depending on what people are doing, the tasks that they're doing. And so, I mean, for a neuroanatomist, this is a candy dispenser. And it was love at first sight. And so I got involved. I, you know, I made the first mistake of going outside my wheelhouse of expertise. But anyway, we started to do these studies on consciousness and memory, addiction, and also things like schizophrenia. And that was going along fine. And then a couple of years after this started, which was kind of the mid-90s, I saw a SWAT team come in, and they were all over the medical school, and it was real, right near where the PET scanner is. And I saw this guy come walking in with manacles uh, with police, and, and then I got a call in the afternoon he said, from another colleague. He says, you've got to take a look at this. And they had started studies of serial killers. And the idea was to go in, these are serial killers that have been caught, and during the penalty phase of the trial, only the penalty phase, they want to show that they're crazy, right? And the devil made me do it. So if we could, they, uh, we could show that they were crazy, uh, it would show up in their scan. So I started analyzing these maybe one or two a year. And it was just kind of a side thing. And everything was going along just fine. Then about six years ago, another colleague showed up with a whole pile of these. They had all these killers' brains, scans of these killers' brains. But it was mixed in with normal people, people with depression, and schizophrenia. And the good thing about this is I had no idea which scan belonged to which person or what they were. It was a blind study, and this was a perfect opportunity. And this is really advantageous because it's so difficult with the legal system to get this kind of data. So I went through and spent a few months looking at it, and I was started to create piles of different areas of the brain that seemed to be malfunctioning in these different people. About three quarters of the way through, I noticed Something, I said, first of all, I knew all, what all the normals were, and I knew the schizophrenics, because I had seen a lot of those, and depressors. There was a whole other group that had a mix of damage, but they all had one th thing in common. They had damage to two parts of the brain. One was the area right above the eyes, orbital cortex, and the front of the temporal lobe. And this really floored me, because it was, it made sense, because one is kind of the animal instinct control of your brain, amygdala, and the other is where ethics and morality are thought to be processed. And the fact that these two were off meant that balance was off, and it made some sense. So I really thought about this and did a lot of reading and developed a theory. You know, three things you need for, to have a psychopathic killer's brain. And I just started to give talks. It was just very interesting to me. About the same time, a funny thing started to happen. And the first was we were doing an Alzheimer's disease study in our lab. It was for clinical trials. We're also trying to discover new genes for schizophrenia, for Alzheimer's and schizophrenia, it's turned out. Now, it turns out my wife's family, loaded with Alzheimer's disease, and she just lost two parents with Alzheimer's. So I said, look it. I went to her and I said, why don't we come in as the controls, get involved, we'll do PET scans, look for genes for uh, what we knew for Alzheimer's, 
and we'll do, I'll get my brothers to come in, and we'll do the kids. And then, if we can see that, you know, anybody has these, you know, high level of these high-risk genes, maybe they can do something. And they can change the way they live, their diet, and all these things. And she said, absolutely. I mean, she was quite heroic about this. And she figured she was going to die of something else, which she didn't, uh, before she, uh, you know, died of Alzheimer's. So, she, we, so we did this. Everybody was enthusiastic. So the results came back. And so I was going through the pile of my family's uh, PET scans. And as I was going through, I was, going, you know, I was really very much relieved because everyone was normal. So and all the way through, there's like eight of these, and the genetics were normal, and I got to one on the bottom, and I thought it was in the wrong pile because I also had all these killer's brains in another pile on the desk. And I said, I've mixed them up. And I looked at it, and it looked like the worst case of, of these uh, you know, psychopathic killer's brains. And it had no activity here and here, the two areas. And I looked down, and it was me. It was my <laughs> name. So, I, I kind of thought, I said, I, I kind of get the joke here because uh, they are giving these talks. So, uh, and it, you know, I, you know I, I, I really thought for a second, and I'm a scientist, was like, isn't that interesting? You know, so, and, and I just reflected back because I was, you know, growing up in New York, I was Catholic boy of the year in New York, which got me to meet Nelson Rockefeller. I don't know why those go together. And, <laughs> And, you know, I was so hyper-religious my whole life that in college, I went to a Catholic college, that a priest there who was a professor said, you're so bad, you got to get out. So he actually gave me an exorcism to get the goody two-shoes out of me. <laughs> I, I had no idea how to sin, really. And, and I learned. It took a while because my heart wasn't in it. But, you know, so you'd go through these steps. So, okay. <laughs> now, so I, I kind of laughed it off because I knew that, you know, I was in jail. I didn't you know, kill anybody. Uh, then I was at a barbecue. We had a family barbecue. The whole family there and the kids and everything. My mother comes over, you know, she's, and she usually does, and she pulls me aside. She says, you know, I hear you've been giving talks about serial killers, and I saw a twinkle in her eye, you know, because she's really, even if she's in her 90s, it seems to be getting worse. Uh, she's very devilish about this. She says, check your father's family out. So we <laughs> said, your cousin, who's an editor of a paper in New York, found this new book, and it's about your father's family. And, uh, and he says, and check your scans very carefully. So I went and I got the book and I read it and I'm going, and it was really wild. It's about the Cornells, who was my, that's my father's family. And in it was the case of the first case of matricide, which is the killing of a mother by a son. And that was in 1667. So it was a very interesting book on you know, how uh, these, these sorts of murder cases were handled back then. But then at the end of the book, there were, there were six more murderers in the same line, going from that family to me. And so we had this whole family, and she loved this because she had to put up the whole life with this thing about being Sicilian, you know? And, <laughs> and her father, you know, lived out in the streets here when he came over from Sicily, he was about 12, uh, just a couple blocks from here. And he had, you know, he had become a boot bootlegger, and she went up to uh, Lucky Luciano's place. So she always gave her the mafia thing, even though she wasn't. This was her chance to get even. So anyway. That was fine, and then I was, within a year, I was invited to give a TED talk. In a TED talk, you got to talk about something interesting, and important, funny, and all this, which is not that easy. So I got desperate, and, I did, and this was a mistake, and I told the first part of the story about my PET scans, and everybody's normal in my family but me, and uh, this thing about these Cornells. So I gave that talk, and within, and this was when TED was just starting to put these talks on YouTube. Somebody called me up and they said, they just put your, your talk on YouTube and it's got like 30,000 hits overnight. And I, and, I, and, I, and, I, you know, and I went kind of blank on this because I made the first no-no uh, about being a hobbit scientist, which is doing something like that. So anyway, I got all these calls, a lot of media things. Head writer for the Wall Street Journal of Science came out and spent some time with us. Uh, I got a, a phone call from the executive producer, head writer of Criminal Minds, Simon Mirren. He says, I got what you're talking about, man, Transgeneral, transgenerational violence. And, all, and he, I, he, he was fantastic, and they both were. It kind of put the pressure on me because I had hanging out there this family history and my PET scans uh, to look further into this. So I looked further into uh, the genetics. And I was trying to look for things 
generally. So we did a very, you know, a broad scan, but having to do with aggression and violence. And the, all these genetics came back in my family, and I can tell you this because every one of them have an average amount of high and low risk genes for aggression and violence. And so they were all cool. And I looked at the last number, and there it was. And I looked at mine, and I, in my own DNA, I had all the high risk alleles for violence and aggression, every one of them. And so these so-called warrior genes, and there's a number of them, the first one is monoamine oxidase, and they control serotonin and some other transmitters. And, um, and so this, it got a little bit more serious. So I started to ask people, because I also I saw in there things having to do with bonding to people were just not right. You know, the cuddling sort of hormones, oxyto oxytocin, vasopressin, and uh, testosterone. And it, it, it hinted at something may not be right. That's when I really uh, took notice. So the next mistake I made is I went around asking everybody what they thought of me. Now, my wife and I have been hanging out, you know, 50 years together. <laughs> what do you really think of me? I said, no, no, tell me, tell me. <laughs> I went down, asked my grandkids, my ki our kids, and people who were really close to me, my friends, and every one of them, including professionals, uh, psychiatrists, who knew me well, said, we've always known you're kind of a sociopath. <laughs> and I went, w w w what? <laughs> I said, you know, and I was in sort of a denial at that point. Every one of them said, you don't connect to people, you're kind of cold and you're kind of superficially glib, and you're great at parties, and you love strangers, and you love world peace and hunger and doing all these things generally. Uh, but in terms of being the person really close to you, your mother, your wife, and other people very close, it ain't such a fun ride. It was quite a disappointing person to be around. And I, <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, at 63, you're not supposed to be finding this stuff out. It's like at 21, you know? If they can fix it, what are you gonna do at 63? So there it was, and you know, the very fact they all agreed, including the professionals I had known and worked with, they just said you're an interesting guy to be around, so they kind of tolerate it, because I'm fun and interesting generally, but emotionally, I don't have the kind of empathy, apparently, <laughs> bonding with people, I'll, I bond with strangers, all you know, strangers and world things. <laughs> it's upside, so I live, and there are actually genes that uh, seem to be associated with these different kinds of empathy. Now I heard this, and after I heard all of it, I didn't care. And I really didn't care. I went, and it was kind of the proof that what they were saying was true. I said, that's interesting, but I really, and I truly, really don't care. Now, it's gotten me to think about, you know, the nature of good and evil and, and about uh, free will and other sorts of things that we hold near and dear uh, to our humanity. And I started thinking about psychopaths, because I also happen to score a little too high on the psychopath test. <laughs> like that. That's exactly how I felt. <laughs> I'm, and not, I'm not a full psychopath. I'm not a psychopath light. I'm what's called a pro-social or successful psychopath. <laughs> Sounds so charming. Isn't it? Anybody want to go out later? I'd be happy to be with you. And and so, and I really started to think, you know, there's a very constant number of these in all sorts of societies that maybe society really needs psychopaths. Because, I mean, do we really want our surgeons to be really empathetic when they're doing the surgery? Do we want somebody cold and calculated and right on the money, right on the spot of doing good surgery? Do we want our Green Berets to really be empathetic where they go, or do we want them to protect us? Uh, and do we want our CEOs and we want our investment people to really be, you know, heartfelt or they want them to just go out and make me some money, man. And <laughs> when I think of it and I said, wait, maybe we need them. We, we, we need this and sometimes it gets out of hand. But really it kind of got to me in the sense that everybody feels this way about me or close to me. People don't know me. They said, oh, that's not true. But people who know said, yes, you've got it, man. <laughs> and so I, I figured just recently in the past two months, Maybe if I just acted the part, even though if I don't feel it at an emotional level. So if I treated the people close to me with kind of caring, kind of civil, uh, <laughs> go to all the funerals and weddings instead of the parties. Uh, if I started doing those things, maybe just acting them out would be a good place to start, just to be a good companion and a good friend. And so that's where I am now.
Thanks.